waiting on the notification. There we go. Did you or did you not hear me? Um, so I want you kind of in the chat right now, just to drop in there. Did, have, am I the only one? Has anybody ever had that moment with their parent? Like, or even as a teacher, as an educator, have you ever had a moment where you needed to just clarify that, you know, I know I said it, did, but did you hear me? Anybody? I'm not the one. Mm -hmm. I know. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes it feels like a little deja vu. Like I said this before, I've been here already. Or did we learn this already? Like those moments happen. Uh, so tonight we are coming from Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. Fear not, I will give you those scriptures via link in just a moment. Uh, but first, let's catch up so we can all know what's going on. So because we're starting at the top of this chapter, I'm going to just make sure we're all up to speed on what's going on and how it relates to tonight's lesson. So just to bring us all up to speed, Moses freed the Israelites from Egypt. We know that. Let my people go. All right. They whined and complained the entire time. So as we know, they were very upset about having to leave Egypt because things were not as comfortable as they were expecting it to be. Uh, they were looking past the miracles and just landing on ungratefulness. Uh, so here we are in Numbers chapter 20, picking up with these, well, not quite the same group of people, but still the children of Israel. God provided for them time and time again in countless ways uh, under the leadership of Moses and the assistance of Aaron. And of course, all of the different leaders that had been uh, assembled amongst the different tribes of Israel. So this story may sound a little bit familiar. In Exodus chapter 17, uh, we hear a moment in which God gives Moses instructions of how to provide water for the children of Israel. Their complaints sound like, why you brought us out of Egypt if you're going to still just bring us to a place just like this? And it, like, we have nothing we need out here. There's not even food. There's not even water. And God tells Moses to go and strike the rock and from it, water will come from the rock. Moses does that and he is obedient. Uh, so when we start reading this tonight, it may seem a little familiar, uh, but I just want to let you know, Exodus 17, where a few weeks after they left out of Egypt, and when we find the children of Israel right now in Numbers chapter 20, it's been an entire 40 years since they left out of Egypt. So while these stories sound a lot alike, and while a lot of times people confuse them for being very close and instance, are being, it, some people confuse them for being the same exact moments. They are very much so separated, and so much separated so, it's like a 40-week span, Okay. Uh, so reminders for you before we uh, read the scripture, you are looking to read. You're going to tell me first what stands out to you. So here are the scriptures coming to you right now in the chat. Please use the link provided. It will bring you to the NLT version of your Bible for Numbers chapter 20 verses 1 through 13. Again, I want you to read that and start jotting out what stands out to you in this passage of scripture.
What stands out to you guys? Anybody yet? Before I say what stands out, can I can I ask a question or you only want what stands out? You can ask. Okay, so I know this is a very popular uh, portion of scripture, but I don't think I've ever really read through it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding clearly. I know you don't have the scriptures up and I don't have my Bible with me. I know like towards the end, uh, Moses and, and, uh, and Aaron get reprimanded, but are they getting reprimanded because they went because so they didn't rep they get reprimanded but is it because they didn't just tell the people to shut up and stop complaining they like went in because i'm just trying to understand where they seem to be disobedient was it that they weren't like just hush people god will provide was it because they went into the tabernacle and fell down and begged god for this thing that he was going to provide i i might be totally off i, I don't know i just i've never read through it i'm trying to understand why they're why they're being punished Okay, so they are punished because, so that is a good question. Um, their punishment and is actually one of the things that I guess are so will end up breaking down. Their punishment is not just because they didn't quiet the people. Uh, their punishment is rooted in the fact that they, they missed, they, they inhibited a moment, they blocked the moment for God's glory to show. Uh, because in Exodus 17, they were first out of Egypt and God was still earning their, um, not earning their trust, but in a wilderness experience, they needed to see and know him differently. So in that, um, so in that when God gave Moses the instruction to strike the rock and water was to come out, it made it real practical. God's going to provide, he's going to do it by this. Bam, it came out. In this instance, uh, God tells Moses to do it, they went to God to ask him how to provide. So that's the first thing to notice. Um, that's the first thing to notice. They went to God to ask him what to do. And a lot of times we seek God and God gives us answers and we leave from that place and we do what we want to with it. So God told them what to do. And instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. The other issues with that is he didn't strike it just out of because that's what you told me to do before. It was because of his frustration, how he felt, and he did it twice. Um, so it was just like blatant disregard for what God had told them to do after they sought his face to ask. And because it, it, it blocked the moment, they were super close to getting to the promised land where these are not the same group of people that were with them weeks out is 40 years later. It was their moment to see God just do a move just from it being spoken to. And and they were punished for that reason. I got it. Now that I look back at verse eight, I do see the specific instruction where he does say, uh, speak mm -hmm. to the rock. I, I didn't see it before. And I see that they did not do that. They, like mm -hmm. you said, struck the rock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they did it out of disobedience. Yeah. It, it's, well... I, I mean, they kind of had an attitude too, like when they assembled the people, like, right. I mean, kind of like to go with you saying, like, they didn't allow for them to see God's love, but almost like God's wrath, like they were upset. Well, that's how to get him striking the rock twice. Like, here, here y'all go, finally go your water, which I'm sure, like, it was annoying having people complaining all day, every day. Cause even mm -hmm. like with the different complaints, I would just, you know, see like, different people almost like surrounding Moses, you know, or Aaron and like, you know, coming to complain, 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 complain. Mm -hmm. But kind of like how you said, that's where their faith and their trust was supposed to go back into God because they went to God and he told them exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay, well, yeah, we heard you, but what we finna do is, the, you know what I'm saying? Is do our own version of it, you yeah. know? So. Yeah, because he even called them rebels. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And he shot and he shouted at him. Yeah. Not say mm -hmm. to shout at the people. Right. All I own it tonight. What else? What else stood out to you? What other attitudes did you notice? Well, this wasn't really an attitude. Well, I don't know if it counts as attitude or not, but like I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I did like in the beginning, um, I think uh verse six where um it says that they fell to their um they fell face down to the ground so just like the idea of like the presence of god like that's how you know um 
what's the word I don't want to use? Grand, maybe, that mm-hmm. God was or like feeling that his presence that they had to, you know, humble yeah. up and fall to the ground. That's something yeah, that's 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 I've never noticed that before. What else did I tell y'all? He struck the rock, the rock twice. Mm-hmm. And I also saw in the very beginning where the people lost faith in their leadership and questioned many things. Mm-hmm. And um, they didn't think they was on holy ground. You know, they say, you brought us to this evil place. We should have died where, where, where they came from, you know. And that's that's the other thing. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you on a second. Okay, anybody else? What else? What else stands out to you? Learning what you learned last year around this time. What's interesting about verse six? Wait a minute. Oh, oh, the we're you talking about the tabernacle study. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The only place they encountered him was the holy of the holies, but it wasn't actually was it? It was him. Yeah. Was that's it the holy they, of the, the holy of the holies, and it was the high priest, just the high priest, just one. Mm-hmm. What, what really stands out to me in verse six is like they're both. It, it, it says they went into the entrance of the tabernacle. Yeah. And if we lay it out in our mindset of what we learned. Like that means they came in and put a, an attitude of wanting to receive, needing right. guidance, but they just entered. They entered just then, and God met them there. Yeah. Which, because sometimes people be like, "Oh, God, mean? Are he messy? Or I didn't have to be all that?" But when you really look at it, like it, it wasn't one. The both of them went into a place where they were greeted in in access to God. You came in here to ask me what to do, and you still did something else. And it's funny how, as people, we still take the mindset of, man, God, you ain't have to do that. When does it ever become, dang, people, why we couldn't just do what we were supposed to do, you know? Um, I, I thought that was interesting. What else stands out to you guys before I do a verse a verse breakdown? What attitudes do we see? What's popping up? We heard some of them named already. It's a bunch of ad- different ones. What what all attitudes do y'all see in this tonight? And you can come off a of mute or put it in the chat, whichever is more comfortable for you. Well, what I see is the attitude of uh, contention, mm-hmm. and then they had an attitude of uh, just not following the authority of the leaders mm-hmm. that had been given to them. Oh, so you're talking about the people? Yes. Okay. There's a lot of characters in this one, so when y'all do share attitude, uh, oh, okay. say to me, yeah, w- which one it is. Okay, mm-hmm. Amber, you pointed out verse 12. Well, what? That's just a standout or attitude that you're pulling out. Um, I'm sensing some attitude with this exclamation point. Um, <laughs> so, um, it's just like more of a since you did this, this is like this is what it's going to be, and that's just that. Like, he just put his foot down in that moment, and I don't know what the label that attitude is, but that's that's definitely some type of attitude there. Mm-hmm. Declarative, let's call it that. <laughs> what else? Yes. I was gonna say for the, for Moses and Aaron, like a attitude of impa- impatience is that a word? Mm-hmm. Impatience with the people, and it's just funny because um, uh, Moses and Aaron have witnessed God be, you know, impatient with the people and their demands and their, you know, whining and they're crying and we need this and how come you're not providing that? And it's just funny to think about how 
patient God, they know how patient God was with the people and for them to turn around and not show that same, like not show that same patience. Cause they've seen time and time again, how the people have messed up since they, you know, left Egypt and then for them to just fly off the handle and not, you know, show them any kind of compassion, not to say compassion, but just to like, totally like, you know, whatever, they just like lost it with them. And Mm -hmm. I feel like when I read 12, I was like, oh God, that was so harsh. But it's sort of like if your leaders are going to behave that way, then, you know what I mean? Like not going to show patience and love and tolerance for the people when they're tripping, then who's going to do it? Because like they're his representatives yeah. and they're supposed to be, you know, they're they're the ones, well, Moses, especially kind of communicating with, that's been communicating with God. And so, yeah. Yeah, the, the expectation was just higher. And I I, I just... I don't know. I've been thinking about that a lot recently, like how we can read scripture and decide, oh, something isn't fair. It shouldn't have been that way. But we we, we skip all the ways in which we aren't fair to a God who literally created and gave chance. Like it's like, uh, it feels a little toxic. OK, I have a question. Um, mother, you cannot answer. Does anyone um, know who that name is in verse one? Is that Moses' wife? Close. His sister. His sister. Oh, his sister. Okay. Right? Yeah. So some people read this and they get real bitter about it. Like that man was already, he was hurt. He was grieving. He was dealing with stuff, you know? So let's go back. Let's walk through this scripture. Okay. Verse one. In the, in the first month of the year, the whole community of Israel arrived in the wilderness of Zin and camped in Kadesh. While they were there, Miriam died and was buried. Let's let's talk about this, though, because we learned um, in our study last year that if we know, if we're seeing in verse six that the tabernacle exists, we also know that the festivals and the traditions do as well. So as they're moving around and migrating, everyone has come together for what's supposed to be done. Now, if you remember, every tribe has been given responsibility of what they are supposed to be doing. Everybody has a contribution of what's supposed to happen when new campground is found. Everybody... Each and every one of those 12 tribes has something to do. And remember, we talked about this before, that when they initially left out of Egypt, it was enough people to span, like they said, a 20 a twenty car box, a 20 box car train, long of people per tribe. It was buku people, okay? That was 40 years ago. So here you are, you've been here, you've practiced your tradition, you've learned what needs to be done, you you know how you should fall in line to implement these things, you get to another town, Moses is grieving the death of his sister, and the first thing that people notice is like, there's no, no water to drink. And instead of everybody still just falling in place and trusting God as the provider that he's been over the span of all of these years, they instinctively go back to just complaining about it. And it's almost crazy when you read Exodus 17 compared to Numbers 20, because you will notice the reason why people get it confused is because they were almost saying the same exact thing. Oh, why you ain't just leave us to die? Why we didn't stay where we were? Oh my goodness, you could have left us in Egypt. These people who some of them have been born into freedom or never experienced what the slavery was like have the nerve to be proclaiming out of their mouth right now, we could have just stayed in Egypt. But this shows you how spoiled they had became. Look at the things that they're listing out that they don't have in verse five. Mind you, this is the same group of people that left slavery into the wilderness in eight manner every day. The things they specifically call out, we don't have no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates. They've been living blessed. They've been living in the overflow. And their complaints right now mirror what they desire to see in a new land. And it made me think about how sometimes if this series follows up about go time, God delivers us from a place where we were or call us to somewhere else. And instead of us remembering the things that we've learned along the journey to cultivate where we are, we automatically complain. 
God has brought you along the journey for you to learn things to implement. Everything you have is everything you need. And instead of trusting that and cultivating it or trusting God and asking, help me see what I already have for where I am, we just start to complain. Lord, this ain't like where I used to be. Why you call me into this season and it's more of the same? Why you allowed this to happen and I'm still just frustrated? It's crazy. Verse six, Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went into the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down to the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. What's beautiful about this is during this time and dealing with these people, Moses and Aaron learned how to deal with these people. They didn't say nothing. They didn't address them. They didn't remind them of what to do. They turned away from them and they went into the entrance of the tabernacle. Because at this point, they go, okay, where we are, we know what we're supposed to do. And the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. Point thing one to really recognize here is if God gathers people, it's for a show. Because I want you to remember, Jesus didn't just heal in front of a crowd. Jesus also healed and did things behind closed doors for people as well. But even when he did things in front of the crowd, even when it was for a show, it was not for the sake of entertainment. It was for faith to be grown. We see this pattern throughout the entire Bible that when this happens, God does not pull people together for, for no reason. They come together so faith can be grown. This is why it's important as a believer to be mindful of how you exist within a group of people. Because if you are in the group, you should be contributing to someone else's faith be grown, growing by way of testimony, by way of your life being an example, by way of words that you speak into other people. But if you are in a community of people and you contribute to chaos, you are not helping faith to grow. You're just a part of a whole different kind of show. Okay? So he tells them, you must take the staff and assemble the entire community as the people watch. So God's instruction was important to them because this is how the miracle will unfold. I did not tell you to gather these people to do what you want to do. When you bring them together as they watch, speak to the rock over there and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. Not only will I give these complaining people what they need, I'm going to make sure that everything that they have is, 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 is watered as well. Why is that important? Somebody tell me, why was it important for the livestock to also get water? So they may leave and they can have food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was also going to say, uh, just to show God's abundance when he does provide. Yes, it was for spiritual, uh, spiritual expansion as well as physical expansion. So yes, you've reached a place that doesn't have these things, but I'm going to protect and provide for you as well as the things that are extended from you so you can continue to extend. Another cool thing, have you ever noticed that livestock is actually a compound word? What does stock mean to us in our financials today? It means things that are, are worthy and valuable and that if you invest into it, it will bring things back to you. So literally their livestock means the living things that is their value. This is why it's important that when they left out of Egypt, God told them, oh no, you take all that because you're going to need it for the journey. So God provided for them from this rock so it can be expansion of their spirituality and their faith as well as provision for the things that they will need camping here where they are. God gave them a wonderful script for a wonderful show of his glory. Verse nine, stop. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. 
Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come together at the rock. And verse 10 right in the middle becomes the issue. Now, Moses, you ain't talked to these people before. You just went to God. God told you what to do and you did it. But then you start talking and it is not what he said to say. God actually ain't saying don't. God didn't tell him say no words in between. He said to speak to the rock. God never even told them to address the people. Bianca, what's the point? Okay, God gives us instructions. And we start to do it just like he said. But then we start talking over what we're doing while we're doing it. I mean, Lord, I'm going to go and talk to her, but you know I don't really rock with her like that. Or I mean, Lord, I'm going to go there, but you know I don't want no parts of it. We start putting our mouth on things that God just asked our hands to do. And what does Moses say? Listen, you rebel. Must we bring you water from this rock? Now, Moses, you tried it. His attitude began to seep from him. Also in him calling them rebels, he's not saying that they're rebelling against God. He's mad that they're rebelling against him. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. mad that they're rebelling against him as a leader. But in that, he rebelled against his leader because God did not ask you to do that. Here's the thing. God creates a plan that if we actually follow it in the way he illuminates to us, without us ever having to say a word, he will regain order to whatever foolishness is happening around you. Certain things you don't even have to speak to. Certain things you don't even have to speak about. Certain things you don't even have to call out. Because yes, it may have been true, but that they were rebels. But in the moment, Moses, nobody gave you lines. Nobody said that that's what you needed to do. Imagine being in a play and decide halfway through it, you're going to start writing your own script. You think the director that's sitting off the side ain't about to feel a certain type of way about that? It doesn't matter if the people laugh or not. When you come off a stage, don't do that tomorrow. That ain't what we talked about. Because there's an order in which things should happen. Yes. I have a question. When he, when Moses flew off the script the last time, was he when he broke the the uh, Ten Commandments? He did he do that on his own because he was frustrated. God did not command him to break those tablets and um, the let, uh, commandments, did he? Let me hold on one second. Because this would have been the second time. Uh, well, not second. This would have been another instance if that is the case of him flying off the handle with the people. Yeah. Uh, it's Exodus thirty-one. Hold on, let me get to it. I want to read the verses right before it because I do remember him breaking it. I don't believe he was instructed to. Uh, oh, wait, that ain't the right scripture. Can I say something while you're looking? Uh huh. After he had said uh, about you rebels. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I thought you was talking about this. Wait, hold on. Let's not uh, hold on one second. Yes. So that was not an instructed thing either. It was a response in anger uh, that he just cast it down from when he saw what it was going on and it was done in um, in rage. So, yes, this this is the the. I feel like maybe there's even more instances, but Moses, yes, this is the other documented time we have. What do you think is the biggest contrast between then and now, though? What do you mean in terms of Moses or the people or where they are or what's happening? Well, yeah, I, I, all that. If you had to compare the two of like why they may not be the same or, you know. Uh, I know <clears throat> he broke the tablets because they were, they had built that golden calf, right? So mm -hmm, they were like mm -hmm. actively going against God and like some of the commandments he had actually given to Moses. This just seems like they're kind of just beg, like they, they're uncomfortable, they're unhappy. 
Well, no, I don't. Hmm. They're not putting another God in front of. They're not putting another God in. Like they were actually trying to create a whole different God Mm -hmm. when Moses got frustrated with him before. They're just not showing a lot of faith in the God that they, the God that they are that they've agreed to follow. In this case. And both him and them, because if he was exhibiting that faith, it would have been him doing so in obedience. Also, too, though, Moses was not standing before a crowd when he broke the the tablets. It was his immediate response and anger to seeing what was going on. And he broke it at the foot and then approached them, right? Uh, Not saying that he was wrong, but I do believe a very big portion of this is because the entire community is assembled. And his defiance of God is done right before God in his presence. But here's the thing, too. God still honors what he said he would do for the people. But Moses had to be held accountable. Now, Mama, what were you about to say? The part I was going to say, the remainder of that tenth verse. Mm-hmm. Once we bring water for you out of this rock. Mm-hmm. It appeared like Moses taking credit. There it is. In the water. There it is. Mm-hmm. So um, in him shouting, you rebels, he's speaking of them rebelling against him as the leader. But while doing so, he's rebelling against God, who is his leader. And then the second half of that, he said, must we bring you water from the rock? Now, mind you, if these two people are standing in front of this group and we know Moses and Aaron went in and that's who came out. And these are the two people standing before us and say that must we the we is Moses and Aaron. So God is still going to bless his people because he's God and he's faithful. But Moses really tried it. Then Moses, oh, uh uh-huh. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. What you was going to say? I was just saying, and then Moses, you know, to be so righteous as if, you know, God didn't give him patience in the beginning. Because let's not make it seem like, you know what I'm saying, that God gave Moses his instructions and he just went. It took a minute. And then he brought Aaron, who wasn't even really supposed to be there because Moses wasn't confident in what God had told him to do. And he didn't think he was a speaker, which kind of goes to baby Moses always had a communication problem that he wasn't, you know what I'm saying, (laughs) that he wasn't comfortable in because he wanted for Aaron to go so that he can talk. So it's just like, you know, you know what? I'm lying. I am getting the people confused. That's not what happened for Aaron to go, though. He didn't. He did ask for a mouthpiece. You're right. You're right. Oh, so oh, yeah. then let's look at verse 11. Then Moses raised his hand and struck the right rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. So the entire community in their livestock stock drank their fill. Let's let's look at this. OK, so he raised his hand. Uh, when else do we know Moses raised raised his hand? Part the Red Sea. I don't know. Part the Red Sea. Yeah, that, yep. Part the Red Sea. When else do we know Moses raised his hand? When the rod, when the rod turned to a snake. Okay, that's a good one. Oh, you did throw back on that one. When else do we know Moses raised his hands? Was it on the mountain? He was always on that mountain. <laughs> Actually, it does take place on top of a mountain. Do you remember when they were in battle and they asked for the day to be extended and Moses' arms grew tired and uh, Joshua and Aaron held his arms up and they 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 won the, the battle, right? Uh, are y'all familiar with that story? No. Oh. That's a new one, girl. You're taking the fans now. Okay, we we're gonna have to um we'll hit that one up next week. That's another good study of attitude. Okay. Um, so we we know Moses with his arms extended. The people have learned at this moment. Okay, Moses' hands go up and stuff happen. Now, here's the thing, too. You have to be careful the attitude in which you give to people. Because somebody may be like, oh, well, I mean, I, I showed up, so they should be happy. Or I'm here, right? Or I did it, right? But if your attitude is not right when you do something, I can't even receive it in love. 
So you just stood up here and called me a rebel. Okay, like they was whining, but you just stood up here and called me a rebel. Must I give you water from this rock? Is attitude like, well, since y'all can't do nothing, let me go ahead and give you some water from this rock. So even though they were fed with what they needed in water and they drank their fill for both them and their livestock, do you think it was received in the attitude of gratefulness or of like, like the Bible says, not to give grudgingly? It was given grudgingly, so I'm pretty sure they received it grudgingly. So what could have been an example of God's love and provision was consequently just looked like a stingy gift. And my question is, how many times do we taint what God is trying to do because of how we feel about something or how we give it to someone else? Yeah, God is going to still provide. Like God may have told you to bless somebody with $20 and yeah, you do it, but you don't do it in a, in a spirit of, of gratitude and love. So yeah, they got the blessing, but their takeaway from it is not, it's like, oh, I don't even want it. Be careful of how you love and give to people, whether it's instruction, whether it's an action, whether it's even in your own obedience of how you carry it out. Verse 12, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, I love how this verse started with but, because even though they were provided for, we needed to know, but God ain't happy about this. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness. So yeah, at the beginning of this chapter, everybody else was having faith issues and tripping, but the two of y'all, you supposed to know better. Now, I don't have any siblings, but I know what it feels like to be the older a cousin in some instances. So I also know what it must feel like for y'all that do have siblings that are older. I know what it sounds like when people say stuff like, you should know better. They just, but you should know better. You have access into my presence. You have been with me on this journey. You've received orders from me before on what to tell the people. You've received the talents from me. I've let my glory shine in your face. I've had all of these moments with you, Moses and Aaron, and y'all want to play with me right now? I expected that maybe from them, but not from you. And my plan was for them. My plan for them was in case you didn't trust me enough, here, let me provide. In case your faith was growing weary, here, let me provide. Because as a good father, that's what I'm supposed to do. But y'all, y'all supposed to know better. But since you didn't trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness, because here's the thing as well. This was not just a demonstration of provision. It was a demonstration of holiness. Why do we think this is a demonstration of holiness? I would love to hear from you guys. Why do you think this was a demonstration of holiness? I think because it, it honors the Lord. You know, uh, we should honor the Lord as holy among, you know, his people at all times. Mm -hmm. So on honoring would have been a way it was holy. Uh, what else do we think is makes it um, that it would have been a demonstration of holiness? I was going <clears> to, <throat> I don't know if this is right, but I was thinking this was something that they absolutely needed. Like it, it was essential, like without water. <clears throat> Like they just wouldn't have made it much farther. And so uh, I guess when I was reading it, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate the fact that I could provide this essential need for my people, mm -hmm. uh, you won't be able to go to the promised land with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good, good observation. What else? If you have your Bibles in front of you, I want you to turn to John chapter four. When you get to John chapter four, you will realize that we are with Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Oh, uh, we, we learned that the tabernacle all foreshadowed to what? The tabernacle foreshadowed 
foreshadow what you got in the church the church yeah yeah no not the church you said the church well the dispensation of god's grace it brings us to the the tabernacle foreshadowed the the messiah right mm -hmm. jesus as the christ Okay, um, John chapter four, I want you to read um, verse 10. It says, Jesus replied, let's go up to verse nine. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Uh, demonstrating holiness. This is another symbolism, comparison, and uh, foreshadowing to that of Christ from the rock, because we call Jesus the rock, right? We reference Jesus as like our chief cornerstone. He's our rock, the rock of our salvation. It's the giant fortitude. And from it comes living water. It was literally going to be the water that they needed to be provided for in that moment, season of life, as well as their livestock. And here they are. If we are to put the comparison here of the rock being Jesus, what did Moses do? Strike. He hit, he hit Jesus. Yeah, he hit it. Yeah. Oh, now I can't. Mm -mm, can't be having that. Not once. Struck it twice. He wanted to demonstrate his holiness. It was holiness of the fact of like, God is so holy that like, while I can't have any parts to do with sin, I can create what needs to be created. I can provide what needs to be provided. I can show up where it needs to be shown up because I am God, I am holy, and I have the way of doing it. And from this rock where there's nothing else around it, where nothing else should be able to touch it, just like a holy God, nothing else can be here. Don't touch the rock. Speak to it because it was holy and you struck it. And now I can't let you lead them into the land I'm giving them. And we also call Jesus the rock, you know. Mm -hmm. rock. He's our rock, our sword, our shield. Mm -hmm. Huh. Another thing with verse 13 is a lot of reasons why people confuse Exodus 17 in this passage of scripture is because now this place is also known as the waters of Meribah, which means arguing. And in Exodus 17, it got that nickname for the same the, the place, too. But they are in completely different regions uh, because they're the people of Israel. Our Israel argued with the Lord and there he demonstrated his holiness among them. Mm, mm, mm. So what do we need to learn, gather, and know from tonight's Bible study? Don't, oh, that's supposed to say lit. Don't let people make you, huh? Excuse me. Berna just said, she texted me, he's our solid foundation. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And when, um, uh, I, I, I don't remember when it was we ended up talking about that, but like even when you hear, uh, Jesus be referenced as our chief cornerstone. It's an old uh, technique of building buildings. And before you can lock everything else in, you had to have a cornerstone, which would be the anchor and the foundation. So, so much symbolism here. And it, it again, when you look at certain things deeper for the, what it really means and what it's supposed to point to, um, we, we shouldn't be as comfortable in what we are of saying like God isn't fair or that's not fair or he was too harsh. Nuh -uh -uh. Too harsh would have been, well, nothing, actually. Grace is just all around. That's just what that is. But don't let people make you miss your blessing. And this is what we I want to focus on here because nobody can make you do anything. Let's, let's clarify that. Nobody can make you do anything. We are all responsible for our own selves and must take accountability for, for it. But ultimately what happened here is Moses allowed his grief. Moses allowed his frustration. Moses allowed very... Um, um, 
physical circumstances to get in the way of the spiritual call that he had upon him. And we need to be careful about that. Oh, I ain't going to church this week because I had a long week. Be careful about that. That when it's time to decide what gets cut, you cut in God. Don't be careful about that, that when it comes down to what needs to be done differently, you cut the corners when it comes to instructions God gives you. Don't don't allow other people stressing you out, uh, disturbing your peace or corrupting something that you think about cause you to miss your blessing because you are so busy being responsive in a moment of emotion or in a moment of attitude that your body language, the, the, the whole way in which you carry yourself affects things that has to exist down the line for you. Because here's the thing, God is still a provider. You just don't have to be a part of that provision all the way. God is still a door opener. Now you have the, you, you have the opportunity to go in or he can sit you down. It doesn't change the fact that he's good. He's still good. You just can't go. It don't change the fact that he's holy. He's still worthy of all praise. You just can't experience it. And that ain't God's fault for being too harsh. It comes down to what are you doing with what you're being told? Next, your anointing does not permit arrogance. Moses got the big head. Just because he was anointed and he knew God would do it. It, Moses had reached a point where he knew God was going to have to do it because he knew they were somewhere where they didn't have, so God was going to have to do it. There's a difference between having confidence in God and having arrogance in the anointing that he's given you so you start just flaunting it all around in any kind of way. Must I give y'all some water? Okay, Moses. Your anointing has officially changed to arrogance. Watch that. Next, God cares, what was my typing doing? God cares about how you do things for him. Two things can be assumed for how Moses and Aaron handled this. Either they didn't really think it was gonna matter how they did it, or they didn't care about what was said. And that's why the title tonight is, did you or did you not hear me? Because here's the thing. Sometimes we hear exactly what God said and we know because he said it, he going to do it. And we trust that he will do it. But somewhere along the way, we start doing it how we want to do it. But God cares about your how. He cares about how you carry it out. I was having this conversation the other day. Some of the stuff just generally comes down to just God is holy and that's it. Our job as believers is to decide, like, are we going to live every day in the reverence of his holiness? Because that's the thing, you know, you save. So I know I'm going to heaven. That's good enough for me. I can do whatever I want to down here. OK, God cares about how you do things for him. If you saying you're serving his kingdom or, or doing ministry or are leading in a certain way and you sloppy about it. Oh, I'm going to just put a little simple decoration or I'm going to just do, I'm going to just do, I'm going to just do. And here's the thing. We all can do what we can with what we have. But if God has given you more and you're giving him morsels, oh, they'll preach. If God has given you more and you're only giving him morsels, that, that's not right. God cares about how you do things for him. And when you do them for him in the right attitude, in the right obedience, along the lines of what he's told you, he will do the rest. Amen. That concludes tonight's lesson. I'm interested in knowing your takeaways. What stood out to you in this week's lesson? I would like to hear from you. Bianca, can you go back one slide? I, I had a parent to moment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Collecting takeaways. For me, my takeaway is, uh, it was mentioned maybe two or three times, 
to be careful how I may complain. Or mm -hmm. cut corners, as you stated. Um, it may cause me to miss my blessings. And to be mindful and practical to honor the Lord as, mm -hmm. as holy among us as his children. Yeah. Take away. And that's the thing, too. Like, I need it to be known because sometimes people hear this and they go, oh, well, God is love and God is grace. That is true. And while we do live under the dispensation of grace because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he's sitting on the right hand side of Jesus interceding on our behalf, it's still not permission for us to just not care. At this point, what, we, what you need to remember more is how you live um, as a believer is just like your gift back of the grace that is given to you. It's your gift back of the love sacrifice and the blood of Christ that has been given for you. It's not that it will kick you out of glory. Like, Cause none of us can, can attest to or say about what we do know. It's like the least you can do. The least we can do is reverence him in our daily living. Okay. I'm gonna shut up. What other takeaways do we have? Um, That's one of my takeaways too, just to piggyback off what you said, like, what Moses and Aaron kind of lost sight of is because they had seen um, God do miracles and do his blessing and not realizing that these people who are 40 years removed from that and living just underneath God's blessing, but not realizing what they came from. So sometimes like, and you say this all the time, like you might be the only person in your um, situation or area where people can see God. So how we have to be careful and mindful of how people see God and see Jesus love in us so that they'll know, like, you know what I'm saying? Know God's love. And so just being careful with our words and like how Miss Amy said, how we complain, I definitely need to, you know, work on that. Like just making sure, cause I might be somebody's only introduction or only encounter with, um, with God and how would that, you know what I'm saying? Work or go. So that's one of our takeaways. Amen. Thanks for sharing. Takeaways, takeaways. Who wants to share a takeaway? I'll share my takeaway. I think for me, just how we talked about Moses and Aaron, they went to the tabernacle. So obviously they went with the attitude of like expectancy. They knew that God would provide. Mm -hmm. But so, and that I apply that to myself, like going to God with the expectation of like expectancy, he will provide, but then not contradicting that because of a lack of faith or anger and do the opposite of what God has already you know, told or promised or showed that he yeah. would do. So just like everybody has said, just watching your attitude, like knowing that God is capable, he will, but then still out of anger, spite, selfishness, whatever attitude I'm in and still choosing to do or handle a situation how I think it should be handled rather than following the instructions that God have clearly given. Amen. That's good. Give me two more and we'll wrap with prayer. Um, I would say for me, it was like a reminder. Um, when we we're talking about the rock and the holiness that it held within it, it made me think of like people um that are like you know how like the water flow through the rock there's things that god has flow through us all the time mm -hmm. for his good so it doesn't matter if it's somebody who has been in their you know their walk for years or for decades or whatever it can be somebody who god is like working on in that season and if we attack that thing or attack that person and we um change the heart of that person mm -hmm. um that that's not going to be settling with god so you can also bless, you know, um, block your blessings that way as well. But let's just something about when you were discussing that, it just made me think of um, just how how many people does that happen to on a daily? Like yeah. people that be so close to just 
coming to the other side, like being whole, one with God and like really him winning people over and that all that can just end in that moment for that time. Not end completely, but you know what I'm saying? But it yeah, can just yeah. stop that in that moment. Um, so when you thought when you said the rock and you, you know, we're talking about his holiness, it's us too, his his own children that we can also look at as that same rock that we were talking about earlier. Amen. That's good. All right. Well, if there isn't anyone else, do we have any prayer requests amongst us to um, lift before God as we prepare to close in prayer? Um, as you guys are putting your prayer request in the chat, a um, <clears throat> few announcements for you. Uh, again, remember, this is the year of deeper understanding. Uh, make sure you're still seeking God's face, asking what it is that he has for you and what you want, uh, he wants for you to do. This is your reminder again that the Babes Conference is going to be February 18th through the 19th in New Orleans at the Double Tree Hotel. Um, and there's also the Heart Gala. If you know any guys that may be blessed by this, there will also be a male conference happening the same weekend in the same place. Um, so make sure you are spreading that word and that you get your tickets. With that being said, have a great week and let's get ready to pray. Lord God, we thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, Lord God. We thank you that you are a provider, Lord. We thank you that you go um, before us and all the things that we need, Lord God, to make plans and you make water flow in the wilderness, Lord God, that you provide not just for ourselves, but the things that are extension of us, Lord. We thank you that we have the opportunity to come into your presence simply by just uh, creating space to sit with you, Lord God, to speak your name, to sing praises to your name, Lord God, that we don't have to go through the process in which Moses and Aaron had to even go into the tabernacle to get instruction from you, Lord God, that all we have to do is just seek your face and trust you at your word. Lord, right now, I pray with my sisters in Christ that are on the call right now. I pray right now that you would anoint them from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, Lord God. And as that anointing continues to be given and flowing through us, Lord, that it will never become an arrogance that allows us to meet people in the boldness of anything that is defiant of you, Lord God. We pray that we'll be mindful of our lives being the examples that they should be, that we'll be mindful of the instructions that you give us and carry them out fully to the end, Lord, that we won't impede a moment that you have uh, so divinely orchestrated for people to see you, to see your glory, to see you make a way, to see you be a miracle, Lord God. Let us speak to the things that you've called us to speak to, Lord God. Let us not strike against it. Let us not feel as if we are doing something for the glory of other people or through the glory of our own selves, Lord, for the provision of other people. Let us be reminded that we are the servants of you. We are the hands and the feet of you, Lord God. We are the mouthpieces of you to do the work that you've called us to do, Lord. I pray that you will continue to embolden us in those things, that we can stand before you and just give your name praise, that we can stand before you as well as your people and do the things that you've called us to do, Lord. We pray that you will continue just to remind us as we study attitude right now, just to continue to bring ourselves before you in self-reflection, to humble ourselves and make sure that we are understanding that none of us are perfect, that we're all on a journey of progression towards pursuing to the things that you've called us to, Lord God. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the salvation plan that you put into plan over 2,000 years ago, Lord. We thank you for all the souls that have been saved, the souls that you are yet saving right now and the souls that will be saved uh, moving forward, Lord God. And let us be mindful that we are contributions to that by way of our life, by way of how we share your gospel throughout the nations, Lord God. We thank you that in the same word of God where Jesus referenced himself as the living water, he spoke to the woman of Samaria, lands that were not yet to be traveled, Lord, but that you gave us the authority to go everywhere, which means no devil in hell can determine where we go, which means no ill word spoken against us can determine where we go, Lord. Give us the willingness that when you tell us to go, we go, we show up, and we do so in the boldness of you, in the full confidence of you being the God who is the way maker, you being the God who makes us triumphant, you being the God who's already declared the victory, Lord. 
We thank you and we love you. Lord God, we pray right now for our mental health and the well-being of us all. Yes, Lord. Lord God, we pray right now over the minds of all of your people, Lord. I don't think we've even began to see uh, the side effects of what COVID will do to people in their mind, Lord. There's so many people trying to adjust to things and not knowing which way to go or how to do it, Lord, but let them seek your face, Lord. Let us understand that there's no such thing as going back to normal, but creating a mindset where we are now that we lean, trust, and depend on you, Lord. We pray that it's not all done in vain, that people will learn to come to you and to yield to you, Lord God. We pray right now that you would just uh, deal with people in their mental illness as well as physical and spiritual, Lord God. And we know that sometimes the word illness can have a connotation of just thinking defeat, Lord, but we know that you even have authority over that, Lord, and because of the Holy Spirit, we can speak to those things too. So right now, we declare healing in the mind. We declare healing in the body. We declare healing in souls, Lord God. Whatever it is that is ailing us and plaguing us, whether it be physically, mentally, or spiritually, Lord God, we call those things out right now and just plead the blood of Jesus that you will allow us to be strong and bold in you. Lord God, any prayer request that was not brought to the table on tonight, Lord, you know. You know the hearts of your people. You know the minds of your people, Lord. And I pray that you will just meet us right where we are. We pray that as we get off of this call tonight, that we'll stay in your presence, that we'll ask, what must I do or how can I do it to serve your kingdom, Lord God? May we do evaluations of ourselves to make sure that we are bringing glory to your name. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I love you guys. I pray that you have a great week. Um, and I will see you next week. And um, my mom had mentioned it would be helpful sometimes to know 